If you're a native speaker of English, you might think you know the sounds of your language, but you don't. In fact, every language is filled with sounds its speakers don't realize they are saying. These are called allophones, a term derived from Greek that literally means other sounds. These other sounds, these allophones, are a bit like alter egos of the main sounds in the language. To explain what I mean, let's look at English. In the words ten and stone, you might think that the T's are identical. Put your hand in front of your mouth, however, and you'll literally feel the difference. Ten is accompanied by a burst of air, while stone is not. To use the linguistic jargon, the T in ten is aspirated, while the T in stone is unaspirated. And if that seems like a meaningless difference, you'd be right, but you're only right in the case of English. Other languages like Chinese contrast to aspirated and unaspirated Ts, so a Chinese speaker could easily recognise the difference in the two English sounds, whereas most English speakers would be none the wiser. In English, aspirated T occurs only at the very start of words or stressed syllables, while T occurs only later in words. They stay in their lanes and don't overlap. They are said to have a complementary distribution, and that's crucial to understanding allophones, the hidden sounds of English and of other languages. Since the aspirated and unaspirated versions of T never appear in the same part of a word, there are no English words that can be distinguished by them. Think of a basic word template, just one syllable, with a vowel in the middle and a consonant on either side. Now think of some of the words we could make, cap, cow, hip, tip, tap, pat. In English, since aspirated T is restricted to just one part of the word and unaspirated T to another, since they are like a Venn diagram that doesn't overlap, you can't have a meaningful contrast between them because they never compete anywhere. Compare this to the sound we represent with the letter D, which we know is distinct from T because pat and pad and dun and ton are different words, despite being differentiated by only one consonant. Contrast is the key word. We can contrast between T and D, but not between aspirated T and unaspirated T, because English doesn't give us the chance to. In short, the aspiration is meaningless as a way of distinguishing words, and so linguists say that in English, aspirated and unaspirated T are allophones. They are alternate versions of the same underlying recognisable sound. We call that underlying recognisable sound a phoneme. You can think of allophones like phases of the moon, and of the moon as a phoneme. The moon might look full or curved, but both appearances are outward manifestations of the same thing at the end of the day. Speakers of a particular language tend only to recognise its phonemes, because that's what we're trained to look out for, because only phonemes are able to distinguish between words. The allophones of any particular phoneme get lost on the airwaves and are mushed together. There are lots more examples of this. In various American dialects, T is pronounced more like a tapped R between vowels, like the sound in the Spanish word garro, but remains a T elsewhere. So an American might pronounce water along the lines of water. Hear the difference? Da, ra, da, ra. A similar situation occurs in some British dialects, in which T becomes a glottal stop, a closure at the back of the vocal tract, between vowels and at the end of words. As a Brit myself, I might say what or water in casual speech. Allophones are usually overlooked by the people who use them, but for others looking in they can be quite obvious. This is why Americans so often make fun of phrases like bottle of water when they hear English accents. Another English example involves the L phoneme, although its allophones might not be present in every dialect. To test if you display these allophones, say the following words, light and full. The L in light is what we call a clear or plain L, with your tongue touching the roof of your mouth at one point near the front. On the other hand, when you pronounce the L in full, you might notice that your tongue pulls up against the back of your mouth as well. This allophone, sometimes referred to as the dark L, 
occurs at the end of words. Allophones may not remain non-contrastive forever. Over time, allophones may split and evolve into independent phonemes. This is what happened with the voiced fricatives of English. Back in Old English, v and z and z were allophones of f, s and th. For clarification, voiced sounds are those which feature a vibration of the vocal cords, whereas unvoiced sounds do not. The voiced allophones were generally used only between vowels, whereas the unvoiced sounds were used in most other places. Again, there was a complementary distribution, but something changed that. On one hand, English began to borrow heavily from foreign languages, notably French, where there was a distinction between f and v. Eventually, the adoption of these foreign words forced a distinction between the two sounds in English, leading to two separate phonemes. At the same time, other sound changes in the language made the distribution between f and v unpredictable. Originally, v used to be used between vowels, but some vowels were dropped at the end of words, leading to lots of cases where this v was no longer surrounded by vowels. This eventually allowed for contrasts between the voiced and unvoiced sounds, as suddenly the voiced versions were appearing in places where previously only the unvoiced sounds had been. Compare teeth, the plural noun, with teeth, the verb, or half, with half. Overall, you might think that the overlooked sounds of English are understandably small variations. Not every language is so reserved. The wildest pair of allophones comes from Hawaii. The island's native language has very few consonants, just eight. So perhaps that's why it allows for such strange allophony. Namely, Hawaiian considers T and K allophones of the same phoneme. This is unusual, because T and K are among the most common sounds. Nearly all languages will have them as independent phonemes, but Hawaiian considers them variants of the same sound. More strangely still, they are allophones with what we call free variation. What is free variation? Well, take everything I've said about allophones and throw it out the window. When in free variation, two allophones can appear anywhere even in the same place, with no restrictions. In Hawaiian, the word kumu, meaning teacher, can be pronounced tumu, if you're feeling like it, and it would be considered the same word. K is apparently slightly more common than T, but the prevalence of one sound over the other seems partly to reflect dialectical and generational differences in speech. If any Hawaiians would like to share their experiences and their manner of speaking in the comments below, I'd be very interested to hear about just how common this pair of allophones is, and whether you tend to stick with just one or the other. Every language has its allophones, and if you're trying to learn one, mastering these intricate specifics of pronunciation will set you apart from novices and bring you closer to native level. With that said, thank you very much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe if you found the video interesting.